Hi Moss here, and today I have Audio DD's R2R11. Now it's been almost 10 years since I first discovered Audio DD, and then back then, you know, I bought a nice pair of headphones, and then I was told on Headfi, oh, you have to buy a good headphone amp for them to sound good. So I bought a good headphone amp, and plugged it into my computer, and mm, not much of an improvement, and then they said, oh no, you need a good DAC. So I bought a nice DAC, and then it's all very tedious. So I, I ended up suggesting to King World of Audio GD that he make a combined DAC amp. Now one of the things we were using back then was this kind of dodgy $99 DAC amp thing from China and we were modifying it actually with King was discrete op amps and then once we did all the modifications everything came to about $250 so I asked King well, can you make something for about $250 that will do all that and well it came out at $350 and was called the Audio GD Compass because it was this first kind of big international push over the last 10 years the kind of $350 mark has been the kind of standard price above say you know $99 components or you know if you combine once you combine all $99 components like the, the, the shit audio ones, you get, you know, around the $200 mark. The only thing is just that even with uh, allowing for inflation, it's kind of like a standard price. So the $350 uh, R2R11 and other $350 components, you know, something I thought I'd look into because it's kind of the entry level high quality audio gear that people are interested in buying. So with that, I'm going to review a number and compare a number of components in that kind of price range. So let's take a look at the R2R11. Inside the box, the R2R11 comes with a power cord, a USB cable with a noise suppressing ferrite on it, and a little bag consisting of a spare LED, spare stick on feet, and some jumpers for changing settings inside the unit. The R2R11 itself is about 26 centimeters deep or so. That's, you know, socket to uh, volume knob. So about 10 inches, a bit over. And uh, it's about 18 centimeters, 18 centimeters wide I measured. So it's not quite as wide as a CTH, but it's a bit deeper. There's, as you can see, a lot crammed in here, and for, for various reasons, yeah, it does look quite complex. Now, starting with the power, this is your transformer, which takes the incoming voltage and transforms it uh, down to a voltage suitable for, for running a, a DAC and amp, and then you have a, your power supply in here, which has to uh, filter and, and optimize that, that, that incoming voltage and smooth things out to make it nice even DC voltage for all the components. Then at the back you have your inputs. A lot of the input circuitry is under here. You won't see it. You can just see the, the, the bottom of the USB board which is mounted upside down. The DAC modules are the DA8 modules which you see in uh, also other uh, Audio GD DACs and there are a couple of those in there. If I tilt this up you can see the, the, the DAC modules in there. So get it in the middle. And they have of course the resistor arrays. Now in the old R2R chips this is all inside a chip but inside a uh, these the hand-built ladder modules. So there are the resistors there in these ladders and they're switched by these switch circuits here. Now that means someone asked me how is DSD processed in these? Well interesting it's not processed by this resistor array ladder that's for PCM. For DSD it uses a separate resistor ladder with separate switches for handling that. So you actually have two arrays there, one for PCM and one for DSD and it's all controlled by it through programmed uh, logic chip, a Xilinx FPGA. So that's how resistor boards work and each board has its own chip and they have their own firmware now the output then goes through these amplification arrays and they look quite complex and that's because you're seeing normally people uh, companies would use op amp chips so they little you know the little chips they that control have an entire circuit and you actually see an op amp which would be the for the DC offset yeah so that's and so you could fit all of this inside a chip this size if you really wanted to and keep it even more compact but King would likes the sound of uh, his own circuits and his own designs and then he can tweak them as necessary and make optimize the sound which is something you can't quite do with an op amp you're kind of stuck with whatever design and sound that has so he's built his own literal op amps on the circuit board there and if you fight like if you want the sound a little bit kind of warmer sounding there are a couple of jumpers here which will probably put in a uh, engage a couple of capacitors i guess to um, soften the sound slightly or maybe change the circuit i'm not sure now you also have uh, another feature in here. Now that the, normally the as the preamp switch and DAC switch at the front, uh, the DAC switch will not will still be in preamp mode, and that's to stop someone accidentally blowing out their speakers or whatever. So to actually use it in pure DAC mode, uh, without just turning the volume to max, to bypass the volume, you actually have to pull out this jumper here and switch it over one notch, and that will um, engage. I guess it affects this relay here and switches it through to pure DAC mode where there's no volume control engaged and you see the volume control is actually mounted on this board it's actually uh, an Alps potometer full size one actually mounted on underneath this board and, and connected via a little ribbon cable 
So that's what you can see. That's very complex, very amazingly complex. A lot of stuff crammed in there, and a lot of work, obviously. So I think that's why a lot of people like the Audio GD products. They feel like they're getting a lot for their money. The the shit audio gear is really tiny, of course, in comparison. Looks really, really tiny. But if you think about it, now this is just an amp. So if I unplug this Valley 2 here, if we put a little Valley 2 on here, we can see, well, look at that. It only takes up a fraction of the space. That's, that's kind of on, even on the edge. But if we grab another component, some other components like, we have a, uh, well, I don't want to unplug the, I've got the Modi, Modi Multi bit under here. I won't unplug that. I'll just put this as, as an equivalent to the Modi Multi bit. Same, same size chassis. So there's the DAC that's it's sitting on top. And what did we see inside? What did we see that was all here? Power supply. So it's kind of equivalent. So what they've put in wall warts is sitting you know, inside the case in here. So it's kind of equivalent in size. It's either one box or multiple boxes. You kind of have a choice in what you get there. So Audio GD goes with its one box thing. You know, the, the original NFB11, which is the Sigma Delta version using uh, Sabre chips, was, you know, they used the same chassis and it had been quite popular. In that, you get all your controls on the front. In this case, your headphone socket. Your headphone variable or preamp switch or fixed. And we saw inside, to get the fixed thing doesn't work, it's still variable until you change that jumper. Then your low and high gain and your three inputs, coaxial, USB and optical. To get to the back, standard setup with the power input on the right, your preamp or DAC output on the, on the left, optical, USB and coaxial. And that's your, your basic setup with the uh, R2R11. When it comes to listening, you know, the R2R11 has three and a half watts of output power, which is more than enough to drive everything here comfortably, albeit, you know, it will be driving that everything pretty much in class A, B mode. I also, like other Audio GD amps, it was pretty quiet. I did the good old uh, Andromeda test where you pair in a plug, plug in a pair of uh, Campfire Audio Andromedas and turn the volume up until you start to get hiss. And I did have to turn it pretty high, you know, kind of way above listening level before I got any significant amount of hiss from them. So in terms of listening, you know, with the Andromedas, if you're curious, actually it was around the nine o'clock mark that I kind of got a mid-level listening volume and, you know, up much higher was starting to get quite loud. So it doesn't allow for a, a, a great amount of volume range for very sensitive IEMs, but given that, you know, the, the output power, it makes it quite a flexible amp in terms of, you know, what it can drive. So in that, it's, it, it did quite well. Maybe when listening to, you know, what kind of sound does it have? Well, like it's Audio GD's standard presentation. It's kind of flat and even, and maybe kind of a touch soft. And I thought a touch soft because, you know, I compared it to Shit Audio's $350 stack, which would be the uh, Modi Multibit, which is an, also an R2R DAC, and the Magni 3, which is their basic $99 amp. And that had a, a fairly similar presentation, but maybe with a bit of sharper presentation, a bit of sh more clear sounding from the, the Shit Audio stack, and the Audio GD may be a touch softer and maybe a touch more forgiving. But in both cases, they were kind of comparable in resolution. Uh, in, in listening, I kind of got a sound stage that was kind of flat and even, but, you know, it wasn't, didn't seem very super wide or they didn't seem to have much depth. You know, it's still very listenable, like if you get up in the morning, you know, even despite the uh, more expensive gear I have here, you could get up, switch it on, plug in some headphones and listen. And both systems were still pleasant and, and capable and enjoyable to listen to. But with higher end systems, obviously, the dynamics are going to be better. And that, you know, things like... Uh, uh, drum impacts are going to sound more more substantial out of a better amp such as the Lear 3 and soundstage depth is going to be more apparent from the higher end amps and that's kind of what you get when you start to jump up to better gear and especially more so when you jump up to a uh, very expensive gear. Just for fun I plugged actually the uh, R2R11 into my main system which consists of an Audio GD Master 10 amp and a pair of uh, LAC4 standing speakers and that, before I did the comparison with using this first, I could cl clearly make out that, you know, it was a, the presentation wasn't softer, not as clear, kind of more vague and, and, and lacked the kind of depth, you know, the, the more, you know, the high end gear had. But all the same, it was interesting to, as a basic DAC amp, it actually worked out quite well. And there's certainly the, the more expensive gear isn't eight times the uh, sound quality, you know, given that they're eight times the price.
And still, these systems redeem themselves quite well, and especially given that you know a lot of modern music isn't you know highly you know highly detailed. It's kind of compressed and and mixed in in many ways. It doesn't make it so great. You know, these kinds of systems, the basic system, are very pleasant to listen with. And in that, you know, ladder DACs do have that that aspect to them where. Maybe, uh, probably much due to some uh, very, very low level, even order harmonics, uh, they do have a kind of very, uh, I want to listen to music kind of presentation. And, you know, the, the Modi Multi bit with this kind of lively presentation, even if it's not the most accurate. And likewise, you know, a, a resistor ladder board ladder deck isn't going to be the most technically accurate, but it's just it was very pleasant to listen with. So of course in comparison you have tube amps and the tube amps we have, have a more kind of entertaining sound you know it's obviously slightly colored because tubes tend to present a slightly colored presentation so you know if I compared you know something like the Valley 2 or the uh, Cavalli tube hybrid was a little bit more entertaining to listen with and then switching back to these kinds of rigs these rigs sounded a little bit more flat uh, and uh, that kind of sounded a little bit more boring in comparison and again I've said in the past comparisons are evil when you start comparing you start going Hmm. But you know, if you buy one of these these setups, you will kind of enjoy it for for, for basic uh, listening with with even a fairly wide variety of headphones, and you don't have to worry about too much about having enough power. You know, they won't do as well as you know the higher end gear, but they still will do quite capably if you know putting on your desk and listening. And most of it comes down to the features and form factor to decide you know whether you you know do you want the, the little stack with the wall warts here? Do you want to you know buy from the you know shit audio particularly do you like them or do you want the kind of more the larger variety of features that this comes with given that it has you know inst instant switch to pre-out mode even though the uh, Magni 3 does have a, uh, a pre-out option it's not switchable and you know you have the two gain settings you know this doesn't have any gain settings and this has you know the three inputs on here although this also has three inputs you know with all that's available kind of the audio GD maybe wins a little bit on uh, you know feature wise but the shit audio stack is kind of smaller and neater and, and wall wart powered so it's kind of we you know what your personal preferences come down to as to which kind of thing you'll buy so that's pretty much the audio GD R to R11 it's certainly a good entry level product I actually was surprised how good it sounded just plugging headphones in straight away despite the fact that I had some high end gear here as always, thanks for listening, and thank you very much to the people who supported making this video. If you do like to become one of them, the equivalent of like buying me a coffee once in a while, you can actually help me make these videos. It does cost me a lot to run all this gear, so if you'd like to help out, it would be much appreciated. So thanks once again for watching, and I'll see you online.